Okay, welcome everybody. Um, let me start out here with the solar news for the week. And um, IQ, uh, the Enphase IQ8 series just received UL certification to the new 1741 standard. It's getting hard to keep up with all of these 1741 UL standards. This one, if you remember, there was the 1741 standard, then they came out with the 1741 SA standard, which dealt with smart inverters. Well, now they've got the 1741 third edition supplement SB standard, which talks about how these systems interact with each other um, as a total system approach. And also it allows for interoperability with the grid because um, what they're really trying to prepare for with these smart inverters is the advent of virtual power plants where the invert or where the utility company can talk to your inverter and uh, your storage system and begin to use your storage system as a virtual power plant. So this new standard is out there to deal with that. And actually the IQ8 series is the very first in series um, inverter series that's received that certification from UL. Um, there's a uh, company called Climate First Bank that's offering solar financing. This might be interesting to you, Bob, since you're always harping about solar financing, but um, it's an online financing process. They say that they'll give you 100% financing within 48 hours, assuming you qualify, obviously. 3.99% interest rate for 25 years, and the big kicker is, is there are no um, financing fees or dealer fees that they re um, refer to. And apparently, I wasn't aware of this, but there are a lot of options out there at the moment where they're offering low interest rates. But when you get into the details of it, they're charging anywhere between 15% and 25% of the cost of the system as a dealer initiation fee for the uh, financing. So this company, Climate First Bank, is, is claiming they will institute none of those. I looked up just to see if anybody was willing to name names um, on, on these guys who are charging these fees. And there was a company called Wheelhouse Credit Union that kept coming up. Uh, not, so, not really good reviews online for this company, but they were offering a 1.89% interest rate, but then they charge you 15.5% of the total loan as a fee up front. So um, not such a great deal. Uh, there was a new solar module uh, out there now, or, or solar cell that was recorded at 39.5% efficiency which is pretty dramatic. This is the world's record um, under one sunlight. Um, so it's a non-concentrated system. It is a uh, triple junction. So uh, if, if you remember, there's a limit, uh, what is it, the quasar um, something limit of about 30%, I think yeah, for a shockley, single. Shockley or, quasar. Shockley, shockley quasar. quasar, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of the physical limitation when you're talking about a single junction cell. This is a three junction or triple cell. They've got a great name for it. These things are called quantum well cells. Sounds very Star Trek-y. Um, so they're getting up to 39.5% um, efficient. Uh, it's a multi-junction PV cell. Uh, it beat the record of 39.2%, which was a six junction cell. These things are very expensive, and at the moment, they really only have applications for satellites um, and drones, things of that nature, very high-tech equipment. Uh, there are 230 uh, consumer and, and um, environmental groups who have filed with the Federal Trade Commission to investigate the utility industry. Um, under allegations of bribery, fake dark money campaigns, and denying access to renewable energy to their customers. Um, it's interesting, if you look at some of the history, I guess in 1935, there was a bill passed called the Public Utility Holding Company Act 
that restricted a lot of the um, abilities of utility companies to do certain things. Well, in, in, um, in 2005, the Congress eliminated or repealed that law. And at that point, these utilities have gotten into um, some, some pretty unsavory practices. We've discussed some of them in the past, but for instance, the ones they highlighted in this article was First Energy here in Ohio, bribing our Speaker of the House, Larry Householder, with a $60 million um, payoff. And as a result, Larry Householder allegedly, let's put that in quotes since he's still on trial, um, he uh, funneled this into a number of uh, other state legislators' campaigns. And amazingly, the state legislature passed a bill which has been referred to as the very worst utility bill ever passed in the history of the United States, in which they gave a $1 billion um, bailout to First Energy, uh, surprisingly. Uh, Florida Power and Light, down there in the Sunshine State, apparently has set up a number of ghost campaigns where anybody running for office who says they're going to crack down on utilities suddenly faces another can candidate with a lot of money behind them, um, funded secretly, apparently, by, first, uh, by um, Florida Power and Light. And in three instances, at least, uh, those utility guys end up winning the election. Um, and 85% of all installers who were surveyed in a recent survey said that the utilities are not following their own procedures, and that results in delays that have uh, slowed down the installation or the interconnection of solar arrays to the grid. In fact, in Minnesota, XL Energy was fined a million dollars for delaying the process. And then two years after paying the fine, apparently still have done nothing about the backlog. So um, it, it's always nice to fine a public utility because then they can just pass those fines on to the ratepayers because they have to stay in business. So, and the European, this I'll put under the category of locking the barn after the horse has already left. Um, the EU has announced they're going to try and phase out Russian oil. Um, seems like Russia's doing a good job of that for the rest of the EU at the moment. Uh, they're hoping to do it by 2027, which <laughs> seems a little um, late. But they're looking at paying uh, about 210 billion euros, hoping to double installed PV in the European Union by 2025. And uh, all new buildings built will have to have solar. They're looking at streamlining the approval uh, process, increasing energy effectiveness. So what, what I found interesting with this, we're already dealing here with supply chain issues. So my guess is if the EU makes a concerted effort um, to, to subsidize basically the installation of solar, we may find that the global supply chain is, is stressed even further. Saw this years ago when Spain and Germany bought up, and Japan even at one point bought up pretty much all the solar cells on the market and uh, caused a uh, price increase for the rest of the world. So we'll see how that plays out. So that's the uh, news from solar at the moment. Anybody have any anything to add or any comments on that? Well, I guess Florida learned that you can pay off the legislator, but if you don't have the governor under your belt, all that money goes to waste. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta pay off everybody. That's um, that's something that the solar industry hopefully is learning. So we we need to have a good lobbying organization with deep pockets to to go out there and and fund the folks who make all the rules for the good of us all. So I don't see Don here. He would be chiming in, I'm sure, about <laughs> government. Okay. Um, anybody have anything they want to bring up for discussion before we jump into um, uh, Mike had brought up a um, uh, proposal. And, and Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about the project? Then I'll pull up the uh, bid that you received 
Um, we can walk through that, but I wanted to get a sense, like we're interviewing you to do the installation here and see what you're looking to accomplish. Okay, um, it's the same property I've mentioned uh, before that uh, we are looking at uh, 144, I mean, 14,400 kilowatt hour per, per year usage. But um, in order to put that much system, that big of system in it, I'm unable to do it all at once. So my plan is to just uh, purchase a smaller system and uh, which the quota is like a 3,300 kilowatt uh, uh, system and uh, plan to eventually add more and uh, add more into, so eventually replace the whole reliance on the electric from the power company. So okay. with that in mind, that uh, there is a couple of the inferred in renew companies send it to me that uh, they are, I guess they are facing it out or clearance which he end up to be just calculated with the 3,300 uh, watt system, it end up to be 1.9, 1. point some dollars per watt, which is ridiculously cheap compared to the other system they quote me. Okay. Um, but the problem I'm meeting is I am not sure if every time I add into a, new panels, more panel into the system if I need to upgrade my inverter or I can get a big enough inverter to begin with so I don't need to keep changing the inverter. Sure. Or pro and con to increase to, to increase the, the, plus, the capacity or it's better just do it one whole big system. So I'm gonna guess if you're doing 14,000 kilowatt hours a year mm -hmm. or, or just about what, 1100 a month? Is that? Yeah, about 1200 right? 1, a month. 1100 a month. So um, trying to think about what, what's your size. Anybody have a good guess? I'm thinking maybe nine, nine KW system for 1100 a month in, in that location. We're, there's a lot of issues there. Is it a south facing, is it on a roof? Um, you will be on the floor, on the ground. What the ground. state is this in? What state? Ohio. Ohio. Okay, so in Chicago, I put in a 10 kilowatt system, mostly on the southern facing wall, good light, and it produced about 13,900 per year. Okay, so you said 10 kW? That's a yeah. pretty good guesstimate. We could, we could narrow that down, but what I'm trying to get to is what is the ultimate size of your array that you want to get to eventually. So, so there we talk a little bit about future-proofing your system because you raise the issue of saying, okay, if I put in a system today and then I want to expand it in two years, do I have to go out and buy a new inverter? You know, um, what are the issues there that we want to address? So that's one of them. So if we just say the ultimate size is 10, 10 kW, um, and is there enough room? Well, there, it's a ground mounted system. So yeah, there would be enough room, I'm assuming mm -hmm. for a 10 kW system. All right, so let me bring up the bid and let's talk about what they, what they propose to you. Um, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, this is your, this is your proposal, right? Can you guys see that yes. okay? So what they're saying, this is ultimately about a 3,300 watt array with a 3KW inverter. Now, as you say, the total price tag is about $2 per watt, which seems pretty reasonable just for the, the um, materials, given that it's a pretty small system. Okay, so a couple of things pop up right off the bat. They're recommending this uh, Sunny uh, SMA Sunny Boy 3, 3KW. Now that's a regular string inverter. And one of the things that they're mentioning within here, they always build this up big, is um, it has 
a 2000 watt secured power supply. So I guess, Mike, one of the questions I would ask you as, a, as an installer is, how important is grid backup in, in, your, in your planning? Is the grid unreliable? Do you want to be able to integrate storage? The grid is pretty reliable in the area. It's just, I'm always a doomsday person. If I want to eventually add to a battery, if the grid goes down, that I want to be able to have the switch boom to turn it off, off the grid, I still have my power. Okay. Yeah, I did a little bit of research on this guy. Uh, I've, I've seen these um, with, the, with, the, um, with the battery, the secure power supply. And basically what that is, is you can wire in a single outlet. And if the grid goes down, you can plug into that single outlet. It's not a whole house or even a critical load backup. It's just mm -hmm. one standard outlet that you can plug stuff into and it will operate when the grid is down. So there's no need for a transfer switch or anything like that because you're isolated from everything else in your house. So that's kind of good if you wanna run extension cords around to, to run an extension cord from there to your refrigerator in an extended power outage or, or whatever. And they're saying that will handle up to 2000 Watts. But bear in mind, it's, it's variable based on sunlight. So 2000 watts is the max, but a cloud comes over and suddenly you've got 80 watt, watts or 800 watts or, and at night you've got nothing. So, so you can't plug in any load that requires a fixed amount of power, you know, that's, that's sensitive, you know, like I guess your kidney dialysis machine or whatever, so. Um, One yeah. question, uh, Jay. Is it possible to use that uh, uh, the outlet to plug into a battery and to start to store the battery then use the battery to connect into another inverter to power the whole house or let it just be redundant? Yeah, at this point, that you, you, if you're wanting to do that, then a, bet, a different inverter is a better idea because, okay. um, because this, as near as I can see, and I read through the installation manual, I don't think there's any way of putting a battery in with this inverter. It, it has that single outlet option, but there is no, it's not battery ready um, okay. to, to just simply add another um, a battery bank in the future. Uh, there are a lot of inverters out there that are battery ready, but this is not one of them. Another thing is this 3KW size, essentially it's maxed out at the moment. So you've installed mm, okay. 3,300 watts of, of panels. Well, if you want to expand, you've got to either add another inverter or replace this inverter. So I don't think this is, is such a good good idea um, or a good option. Now, Sunny Boy does make bigger inverters. And instead of paying 1200 bucks, you might be able to get one for 1900 bucks that's sized as a 10 kW inverter that might meet all of your requirements as you expand the system. Because it's fine to hook up fewer panels to a bigger inverter. Bob, you had a question there? Yeah, I just wanted to point out on panels, I'm finding that there are two warranties. The extended warranty usually means that after 25 years, it's producing 92% uh, of the power per rated over the 25 years. But there's also a workmanship warranty uh, on it. And the cheaper panels seem to go down to 10, 10 years, 12 years and stuff like that, where Silfab will go up to 25 years uh, okay. on it. So if they're not, if they don't believe in their panel is going to make it for 10 to 12 years up because of their workmanship, I don't believe it either. Yeah. So you might want to check out, it says 25 year extended, but you might want to see what their workmanship warranty is. I'm not familiar with this brand, but that doesn't really mm -hmm. mean anything because there are so many brands out there. They might be really good or they might be, you know, not so great. So you might want to look into that. 
Um, the price mm -hmm. tag on them looks like it's in the, what, 60 cents, 65 cents a watt, which mm -hmm. is pretty reasonable at the moment. Um, you know, we were seeing 50 cent a watt panels for a while, but prices have gone up a little bit because of because of lack of supply. Okay. Now they've also added in here the Tygo optimizers. Whoops, I jumped down. These Tygo optimizers, these are really designed for rapid shutdown um, and they will optimize. So because this is a ground mounted system, it's possible you could do away with this if you wanted to. It's not a bad idea to have the optimizers on every panel. But when you do install them on a roof, you've got to have some sort of electronic device, the module level of electronic device installed to shut off at the panel when the grid goes down. But a ground mounted system, because nobody lives within it, they don't require that rapid shutdown. But these will also optimize the MPPT tracking individually so you'll get a little bit higher production from it. Whether that's $440 worth of additional production, I don't know. Um, that's, that's something to, to explore. If there's no shading there and it's a ground mounted system, I don't know that you'll get much out of having the optimizer. Okay. Uh, the Emporia, uh, it's an eight sensor bundle. And what this is, is for current and load monitoring. So this is not really part of your production system, but we've talked about in past um, uh, calls about the ability now to monitor at the circuit breaker level, um, the consumption that's happening real time within your home. And that's what this system is, is it's a little, it, it has um, eight of these little, um, what are they called? Uh, C, C, I was gonna say CRTs, but that doesn't sound right. What are those little amp readers that clamp on to, um, to the um, different breakers, uh, the wires feeding them? And you can monitor, um, pardon? The amp, you're talking about an amp clamp or you're talking about something that's specifically designed for the, oh, consumption meters. Yeah, they're basically consumption meters, but they're, but well, they're consumption, um, readers and then the meter okay. is handled wirelessly. Um, okay, these okay. things clamp around uh, eight different circuit breakers in your in your service panel and you can monitor and control eight of those. Uh, those things here, what they're showing in this particular line item are just the monitoring rings and then they've given you four smart plugs. So those are the things where like you would plug in different um, uh, loads that you might wanna control remotely. So the idea there is let's say that in, you've got a high demand and you've left, uh, you're not at home, you can go on your phone and say, I'm gonna turn off this air conditioning unit that's plugged into that, into that um, smart plug. So mm -hmm. it, it's just another tool out there that at the load level, you can control from your phone remotely, you know, turn things on, turn them off. So this, it's a nice thing. You don't have to have these. There are other systems out there. They're just recommending this as part of your system. It's not dependent on the inverter that you're, that you're installing. And you could install this without a solar system in your house. You know, doesn't, it's not a solar based thing. Then you get into the Iron Ridge um, railing. And I guess uh, one thing I didn't look at, oh yeah, this is a ground mounted bits. You'll still have to buy the pipe locally. These systems are, are um, designed so they fit on top of uh, two inch here, two inch schedule 40 pipes. So you would have to go down to your local supplier like Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever and buy the actual vertical pipes and cut those and install them. And then this Iron Ridge system fits on top of those installed pipes. So, mm -hmm. so there's gonna be more cost than just what's right here. Um, used to be that was a fairly limited amount of money, 
because you're, you're going to be looking at probably eight of these vertical pipes. And then you got to dig holes and put concrete in the holes and, and put these things in and get them plumb. But I know the last time I installed one of these systems, like the first time I installed them, I paid about 30 bucks a piece for the pipes. And then the last time it was more like $90 a piece for these pipes. So, so the cost of metal has gone insane. So, so you might have to factor that in. And that Iron Ridge system, you can either get them with two inch or with three inch. Uh, obviously there's more cost in the three inch pipe, but then the, you need fewer of them. So you might get by with three, three in, or six three inch pipes or eight two inch pipes. But then depending on which one you select, they've selected two inch for you. You'd have to get the different bits and bobs that go with the three inch pipe. Yeah, Bob. I found Sun Moto instead of uh, Iron Ridge is at least uh, one third cheaper. Uh, and you get basically the same thing with the same uh, specifications and stuff. Okay. okay. What's it called again? Sun, S U N Moto, M O D O. Sun Moto. Okay. The nice thing about Iron Ridge, of course, is they have a nice online tool that you can use to design the system. So you can use their online tool and then go ahead and buy the product from Sun Moto or something. You know, it's like, no, it's like shopping has, at Home Depot and then ordering online, you know. No, Sun Moto has the same tools online. Oh, okay, good. All right. Yeah, I suspect most of the racking manufacturers have similar, because what that does is once you plug in all the bits, it will say, okay, here's how far apart these um, piers have to be located. Here's the spacing. Here's the depth of the hole. Uh, how wide does the hole have to be? How deep does it have to be? How much concrete are you going to need to to put into that hole? Um, and and they base all of that when you plug in your zip code. It factors in snow loading, wind loading, uh, seismic activity for your region, and then it builds you or it designs you a system that will meet all of those different environmental issues. So that's quite, quite handy. Then you start getting into some of the little clips. Uh, you've got a square D AC disconnect. That's a good price for that. You could, I mean, that's just your main AC disconnect that has to be located out next to the meter. Um, so that you could get that at Home Depot if you want, but I don't think you get a better price. And, uh, some of the tools, they have some, some, it looks like they're giving you some tools to make jumpers um, or these are the connectors and then some wire. But then later you've got a tool there, uh, grounding wire, disconnects. One thing that's always a bit of a annoyance is how much they charge for the labels that you stick on these, uh, on these systems. Looking at this, you know, 65 bucks for little labels to stick on all the different um, pieces of equipment. I mean, that's insane. And, uh, and then they're charging you some insurance for shipping. You know, I guess that's just part of their thing. 60 bucks or so for that. That's not terrible. Okay, so, so it's, it's not a bad proposal, but based on what you're looking for, I don't think, you know, I wouldn't recommend this system for a couple of reasons. One is you want to expand it in the future and this has no room for expansion. So that's, that's a big reason. Um, if you want to be able to add batteries in the future, this has no ability for adding batteries. So it's a very much a straight grid tied system. It does have that one little plug for emergency things. So your teenage daughter can charge her cell phone or whatever. That's probably about all it's going to be good for. Um, but, but it's there, you know, it exists. So, so then what are some of the alternatives? Well, one alternative would be to get a bigger inverter. Um, you know, you could, uh, if you like the, um, the idea of the, uh, of the Sunny Boy, you know, I, I'm pulling up this. This is Alt E's website. I, you don't have to buy from them, but I just find it's it's an easy one to uh, to navigate. 
So let's say we go into the inverters. Oh, I better get into their home. I was looking up some end phase stuff. All right, so if you look at the inverter size and you just want a simple grid tied inverter, well, if we want to get up to 8kW plus up here in the 10kW range, there's Fronius, Solar Edge. That's pretty much all they're looking at. Um, you can see that the price of a 10kW is going to be about 2,700 bucks versus the, uh, what was it, $1,200 or so that, that they had bid you out on that. Or you can get a Solar Edge, which is going to be typically um, battery ready. That's going to be 2,500 bucks. So by, by anticipating the um, size of your system in advance, you're going to um, add about, looks like $1,500 or so to the cost if you put in a bigger inverter. Now, the risk there is what happens if you don't expand your system within the warranty time period of this inverter that you just bought? You know, it's got a 10-year life expectancy, say, and you're thinking you're going to expand, but you never quite get around to it. You just spent 1500 bucks on something that you never used that added capacity. So that's a, that's a downside. So, so what I would lean towards recommending based on what you've just told me is, is a microinverter system. And that is going to have a little bit more upfront cost but I think you're going to find that it's a lot more flexible because you're saying, I want to be able to add a little bit in the future. Um, so for instance, the um, IQ8 here is $190 each unit. Well, you're putting in 10 panels, so you're going to have 1900 bucks instead of buying a string inverter. Well, you don't need the optimizers because the module level power electronic, the rapid shutdown, everything is right there in the microinverter. So when we're comparing 1900 in this scenario to, um, to basically 1200 plus another four or $500 that they had for the optimizers in your, in your bid. So it's basically 1900 versus 1700. So that's not, that's not terrible, but with microinverters, you can just add one panel, two panels, 10 panels, whatever, whenever you want to. Uh, each panel functions independently of every other panel. So, so that's a good option in, in your scenario. But the uh, battery backup is a little bit trickier here because, um, because there are a couple of um, products here. Let me just show you that you would want to integrate if you want to add batteries in the future. And the first one is this smart switch. This is your um, essentially your, your automatic transfer switch. So if the grid goes down, you go into standalone mode. And that's pretty pricey. You know, <laughs> it's 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 uh, you know another eighteen hundred bucks, basically doubling the cost of your of your um, in, inverter system. Um, now, if you were to add that into your system right now, the N phase eight, uh, the IQ eight, has the ability to function when the sun is shining without batteries. Okay, so you would have full array power available to you as long as the sun is shining, if you integrated that without any batteries or anything. So that's, that's available there to you as an option. Um, but that's a $1,700 option. Now, if you want to add batteries, you'd have to go with an, with an end phase battery. There's this 10.5 kilowatt hour battery, which is about $9,000 which is basically three of these, these 3.36 combined in one box. So a small battery bank system is gonna add about 3000 bucks to it. 
So, so what I usually think about when I'm talking about battery banks uh, with an end phase system is to add battery backup system, you're gonna have to add this component and this component. So it's gonna cost you about 5,000 bucks minimum to put in any kind of battery backup system using microinverters. Using string inverters, it's probably gonna cost as much or more, you know, cause the batteries for those are pretty expensive as well. Um, and you will still have to have a transfer switch and something like that. It may not be quite 1700 bucks, but it'll probably be, you know, close to a thousand dollars for any kind of transfer switch to disconnect you from the grid when you're in standalone operation, which is something you have to do when you're using battery backup because you don't want to be feeding power out onto the grid. So that's, a, that's an issue. And then the other thing you'd need to add into your system is uh, this combiner box. And so that'd be another 700 bucks into it. Um, so, so now we're kind of in your ballpark saying, all right, do you want to get off real cheap? Because the, the bid that they gave you is about as cheap as you're going to get, but it's not going to allow you to expand your system in the future, and it's not going to allow you to integrate battery backup. So then it's a matter of what are your priorities? Well, I will say my priority, I'm cheap. Yeah. I don't like to pay power company. <laughs> I mean, just honestly. Yeah. Um, so I would say the battery power up is not as primary, but eventually I go going to get there. Okay. But, well, but with this, uh, you the one you said the M phase power smart switch in the future have the capability to put the battery on with it, then I will definitely go with that because it gives me freedom to do what I want in the future. If at the very end I say I can afford the the $9,000 or $3,000 battery, would I just be able, if I have access to huge amount of full, like a lithium battery, now those are specific ones, will I still be able to hook those battery on in a series with the M-Phase Power Smart Switch? Yes, yeah, and, and what you could do is, and, and I guess this is what I would recommend just hearing what you're saying, is go with a microinverter system with this mm -hmm. Envoy combiner box because that gives you the ability to add more quite easily so that the installation time in the future is gonna be much, much less. And then design all the wiring in your system to, to handle the amps at the maximum of your total build out. You know, mm -hmm. So putting in bigger wire now rather than later so you don't have to do any any retrofit as you're adding these kind of systems in. And bear in mind where the um, smart switch and your batteries might be located and just kind of design your system to think, well, someday in the future, I might add those units in. So let's make sure I don't do anything right <clears throat> now that keeps that from happening. Um, you know, So it doesn't add cost, but it just adds awareness as you're designing your system that this is where I'm gonna put this thing and I need to make sure I don't, you know, I have wire big enough to accommodate it. You know, usually the wire in these systems is not that much. Like for instance, we did a, a Ray, uh, an install in Columbus and he installed right about the same size you're talking about. It was about a 4KW um, array. Um, but he was thinking he might expand it to 12 kW in the future. So a 4 kW array pretty much maximized one circuit, one branch circuit of the, um, of the uh, end phase microinverters. And these Envoy combiner boxes will take up to three circuits um, coming in or they'll actually handle, I think, 80 amps total. So one of those circuits was 20 amps. So we could have gone up to four. So we installed that Envoy combiner box right on the wall behind, on the outside of the building, on the outside of where their service panel is. 
And then the wire that ran from the combiner box to the service panel was sized big enough to handle 80 amps of power, even though we we're only running 20 amps today. But it gave us the flexibility of adding three more circuits into the mix without having to change any wire at all in the future. We just have to change breakers. Yeah, Bob. All right, so that would be like a two watt wire. Sounds about right, yeah. yeah. Two out wire, not three. You, you would need a two out. Yeah, uh, and it's not. Thing, it wasn't a long run either. It was like fifteen yeah. feet. You know. Yeah. The other thing is, is that uh, as far as the wire costs are concerned, uh, shut off boxes, all the electrical side of that. I I, I went over to Home Depot. I, I did all of that, and I'm finding that I went to Steiner Electric, which is in Ohio. Also, it's a national firm, Steiner. And I gave them the whole enchilada, and they beat everything. Yeah. Uh, they are they are a, a, a national professional electrical distributor. Okay. Uh, you say Steiner? S T I N E R Steiner. And they're in Ohio. Okay. Yeah. Another thing to bear in mind, like with the AC disconnects and things like that, when you're future proofing your system. I told you to size the wire to the maximum, like 80 amps in this case. Mm -hmm. Well, you'd want to size your disconnect to the maximum bus bar rating as well. So you'd, you wouldn't want to put a 30 amp disconnect in. You'd want to put one that will handle up to 80 amps, even though you're putting capacity in today that you're not necessarily using. But, you know, it beats switching them out, you know, and having to do rework later and the cost difference isn't going to be that much instead of $75 for the disconnect you might pay $105 you know well 40 bucks now to mean that you don't have to replace it later is is good you know it's it's just money well spent so so you'd want to design all of the infrastructure as if it were built out to its maximum capacity you know that the whole thing could ever handle and go ahead and install that just this one time. Um, and, and then when you add things in the future, it'll be pretty simple. So okay. I have a question. Sure. Uh, you, you were talking about the uh, end phase eight pluses. Don't I have to use an end phase uh, 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 combiner box for that uh, eight series? You wouldn't have to if you're only gonna one, run one string, you know, one, one branch circuit. So yeah, the end phase combiner box is right down here, this little $700 unit. You can get them cheaper out there. You can get them for like 600, you know, something. But uh, yeah, this just allows you. Um, yeah, I guess the other advantage of that though is it also has the communication system built in. So yeah, you're, you're right. It, it used to be you had to pay 600 bucks for the communication system. And then you could use anybody's combiner box, but now you pay 700 bucks and you get the, the communication system as well. And so. watch it, there's a separate communication system that they sell for another three, three, 350 that hooks up to your, your phone uh, antennas and you don't want that. Yeah. Don't pay the extra. This thing will just simply hook into your Wi-Fi. Um, you know, it's very easy. It also, it has, it has a little adapter for cellular if you don't have Wi-Fi, if you're putting it in a place where you can't get Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, but, but don't get the cellular, don't get that. No, it, it's, it's easy. It's actually quite easy to install this whole, this whole unit. So I think it was a really good product that they came out with that whole combiner box. Makes life really easy. You just bring the wires in from the branch circuit, connect them in there the programming of the communications all integrated. You don't need a separate two, um, used to be your communication system had to hook into your service panel. So you needed two double pole breaker slots in your service panel. Well, now you don't need that because it's all in the combiner box. So you just need to hook in at one double pole breaker uh, in, in, the, in the service panel. So. Okay. So have we sold you on end phase, Mike? Are you, are you leaning that way? I am really tempted. <laughs> well, I'll bet you the, the price tag will come in 
uh, my guess is six, seven hundred dollars more. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a little bit more than that. You can get rid of that whole, um, you know, monitoring at the circuit level, um, you know, because that's a new industry and you're going to find that there are a lot of better options emerging. So unless you really need to monitor and control your loads, I would hold off and let that, let that play itself out. Um, okay. You know, so a lot of those things are going to go away um, once you, yeah, you don't need the, um, you don't need all your connectors. You don't need some of those tools. You're not going to need all that PV wire because you're just hooking in as a branch circuit. It's all AC wiring with end phase. So who knows? I Maybe, also, yeah. I also believe that you're going to save that amount of money when you go with uh, Senmoto. And you're also going to get a, uh, more of a discount on the hardware electrical side uh, with Steiner. So I think that it's going to come out. Another thing to consider is because Enphase just came out with their uh, IQ8 series. And in this scenario, you're not taking advantage of the fact that they will operate when the grid is down. You could go out and buy some remaindered IQ6s uh, or IQ7s. And, and probably get them for, well, like I did back when I installed, when the IQ7 came out, I bought some, uh, some of the older models. They were actually the 215s, or no, the 250s, the M250s. And I got them for $200, or $29 a piece instead of $180 a piece. So, uh, you know, you can get some of these because they're just trying to clean out their inventory because it's like, it's like when the iPhone 10 or whatever comes out, you know, nobody wants the iPhone 4. Well, you don't care. You just want to make a phone call. You know, you're not worrying about whether it's got 700 billion pixels on its, on its camera because you're not going to use it as a camera, you know. So uh, that's an option for you. Yeah, Bob. <clears throat> My understanding was that if you get IQ7, you have to do an IQ7 combiner box. The communication from an eight to a seven is not gonna work. I, I know that for sure. It's uh, okay. Well then. Um... But, but, but you're right. I, <clears throat> the reason why I, I put in IQ7s is that uh, with the uh, uh, IQ7 plus microinverters, it, it's putting out less than the eight is. So you, 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 panel sizes have to be smaller than uh, what it is today. I mean, today it's not, not uncommon to do a 410 um, watt panels. Yeah, the IQ7 Plus, if we pull this up here, it's uh, it's got a top range, looks like, uh, is this the IQ7 Plus here? commonly used, you can use 235 watt to 440 watt panels in there, but it's AC output is gonna be, if I remember 295, I think, uh, where's AC up? Yeah, here we are, 295 watts. So regardless of what size panel, as long as it's at least 295 watts, that microinverter is gonna clip it off at 295. So if you put a 350 or a 330, It'll work just fine, but it will never produce more than 295 watts. And, and we've talked about that because of the, the clipping process that a 1.2 ratio, so a panel that's 1.2 times the size of the inverter is the ideal. 1.2 or 1.3? Well, they're getting bigger and bigger, but 1.2 is still sort of considered to be the sweet spot. 1.3 is fine too, but um, 1.2 is when I look at the literature, that's where they seem to settle, but it's moving up. It's moving up all the time. So if, if you had a, what in this case, a 350 watt panel with a 295, you'd be right there in the sweet spot. Um, you know. What about a 270? No, then it's never going to produce more than 270. You know, it, it's like putting an undersized. It'll work. It'll work. This will accept a panel, I think, up to 
up to 235 or down to 235. But then you're never taking advantage of the inverter's full capacity ever, you know. So I wouldn't put undersized on unless you just have to, unless that's your only option. It'll still work. So any 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 other questions on this particular design? I do have one question. It's sure. for the mounting. Is the is the mounting actually have a specific reason for to mount it using the their mounting, or is it like I can build like a <laughs> of my own mounting like that? Yeah. Yes. I'll tell you, yes, <laughs> there's a real reason you don't want to try and build your own for okay. several reasons. One is um, probably your, your local jurisdiction having authority is not going to approve it because you don't know what you're doing. Neither do I, you know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of factors involved in mounting systems. I just mentioned about snow loading about wind loading, about seismic activity, but the physical supports have to be engineered in a certain way. The, the tensions, the, the torque specifications, the, uh, for a rooftop mounted system, there's how deep in do the bolts have to go? What kind of, what kind of shear strength is there? What kind of pullout strength? So, so the Iron Ridge, for example, or pretty much all of the uh, racking systems, they will provide you with a uh, stamped um, design that says, mm -hmm. so you can walk into your authority, you know, to your permitting office or whatever and say, here is a drawing for my racking system. It's been reviewed and stamped by a professional engineer to meet all of the different building code specifications that are required. And, uh, and it doesn't cost you anything to have that done. Whereas if you walked in with your own personal, this is Mike's and I drew it on the back of a napkin and I think it'll work, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna look at that and say, okay. yeah, yeah, that's, that's what we want in our city, you know, so, <laughs> so yeah, okay. it's, 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 it's theoretical, uh, theoretically possible to do, but not, not, not good practice. Too much liability on you. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some out there in the world where we there's some artists who will do some welding. You know, uh, they do a really beautiful designs, and and you know they probably hold up. But these are sort of Appalachian out in the hills kind of installs mm -hmm. where there's no permitting, and and if it did blow over, the guy'd take his his you know welding equipment out there and fix it. So, but that's not it's not really for the typical suburban home. Okay, thank you. You guys really helped me so much. There was so much I didn't know. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks. I was confused with that as to why they didn't make it battery ready. I mean, in the world, um, but it, when I was researching a lot of the SMA, they have a whole line of AC coupled inverters. And I found mm -hmm. that was interesting because if you, if you look at some of the installation videos for AC coupled inverters, there's nowhere to connect the grid or the um, uh, solar array to it, which makes sense because they're not designed to connect directly to the array. They're only designed, their only DC input is from batteries. And then mm -hmm. their AC output is to the, to the home and ultimately to the grid. So, um, so they're a second inverter system added on to an inverter system that already exists. So it's, okay. a, it's an interesting option, so. Hmm. Okay, any, Okay, any, thank you very much. Sure, anybody have any, any comments, anything else that you thought of as we're going over all of this? Yeah, maybe uh, regarding the attachment of uh, Iron Ridge, um, the engineering, uh, I've been working with it quite a bit. And um, when it comes to ground mounts, and I think the discussion was about a ground mount here. Yeah. Um, when it comes to ground mount, the, uh, the Iron Ridge um, engineering on their, on their website will include everything but the uh, foundation detail. They are not assuming liability for the foundation because, I mean, understandably so, they don't know the soil conditions. 
So whenever I do a ground mount with Ironrich, I mean, I run it through the Ironrich designer and I get the wrecking and everything kind of like pre-calculated and done and print it out. But I always need to uh, provide separate, I need to provide a separate um, foundation detail and calculation possibly. Um, so they, so they took that off their system because I know it used to tell you even how many square yards or cubic yards of concrete you would need. Um, I have done it this year a couple of times and it was not included. So, oh, okay. So, uh, uh, it also depends on wh what you choose. Uh, I mean, you can have a, a concrete foundation or you can use a helical anchor or they have those ground screws that, that may be available. I'm not sure if they're available on, on, on Iron Rich. I may confuse some manufacturers, but mm -hmm. um, particularly with a helical or the ground screws, the uh, the pullout resistance depends on the soil condition and uh, they cannot make a judgment on what the soil is like. Right, so, right. So yeah, what, uh, he's, what he's talking about with the helical piers is if you mm -hmm. think about those old doggy stakes that you would screw down into the ground mm -hmm. and, and tie up a dog in your backyard, that's basically what they're doing. They're just screwing in. It's got a sort of an angled flat disc kind of thing built into the bottom of it and it screws down in. The advantage there is you can install those without having to wait for concrete to dry or anything like that. They they do that a lot with um, larger ground mounted systems, you know, where they have like a, a a bobcat or an arm of some sort that just simply an auger that drills the thing down into the ground, and then you can mount the the pole on top of it. So my 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 point is um, if if the um, permit application is being rejected for an iron rich ground mount, it's most likely be because of the um, uh, foundation detail. They yeah. probably wanna have an engineer uh, take the liability. Yeah. Most, most likely it is. I mean, in some jurisdiction you pass anyway, so. I always got a chuckle when I was doing the ground mounted, the iron ridge back when I did it. I mean, they gave you this, they'd want you to do like a two foot in diameter hole, five feet deep, fill this thing with concrete, put this single pole down into it. And, and it was like attaching a Volkswagen bug to the bottom of this pole. It was so much weight. And then you put the top cap on and attach the top cap with a set screw, you know? So you've got this 2000 pounds of concrete holding it, but the only thing holding it to that pole is a, is a silly little, set screw and and so of course i'd take the set screw out and drill a hole through it and put a bolt in there because i figure i don't mm. want that thing going anywhere but um it's a strange what these people design into their systems all right anything else before we call it and we're right up to the hour okay well i'll see you guys next week take care all right bye-bye